Welcome to the Career Medis Podcast. I'm your host, Nisar Ahmed. I'm the founder and editor of the blog, careermedis.com. And this is episode five of the Career Medis Podcast. And this episode is particularly part of the expert series. And for today's expert series episode, I'm interviewing Roy Osing from Be Different or Be Dead.com. Uh, before I bring on Roy, I'd like to read a quick introduction of Roy. I'm sure Roy has a lot more to tell us than my quick introduction. But here's a very quick intro I have about Roy. Um, so Roy Osing is a former president and CMO with over 33 years of leadership experience, covering all the major business functions, including business strategy, marketing, sales, customer service, and people development. He's a blogger, content marketer, educator, coach, advisor, and author of the book series, Be Different or Be Dead. You can also read more of Roy Osing's articles at his website, be different or be dead.com. So Roy, uh, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, uh, Nassar. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thanks uh, for joining, and I, I hope my introduction uh, uh, was was a decent one. Uh, I know there is much more than what I just read right now, but I hope that was a decent introduction. I, I think it very very decent. The only thing I would add for your uh, your listeners who um, I'm sure thirst for resources um, to uh, be available to kind of give them different perspectives is. I'm doing an awful lot of writing right now for yourself, as well as other channels, including the, um, uh, the Globe and Mail, on uh, a variety of subjects that relate to my, my bio. I write on uh, leadership, uh, corporate culture, uh, workplace careers, a lot of work in, on young professionals that you and I will have, are working together on and we'll discuss today, as well as... Um, um, innovation and uh, and and as I say, work workplace culture. So I'm trying to create from my work as many resources uh, as I can and make them available to folks who are uh, obviously looking for new ideas and looking for help. No, wonderful and uh, yeah, and we do have a monthly column on CareerMedis.com. You're a regular contributor. And one more thing I, I think I, I should talk about, uh, your percep my perception of you or your personal brand, you're very practical, the advice you write about. And I think you, evolved, you and I have spoken before. Um, you believe in practicality versus theory. Yeah. So. No, no question. And, you know, I, I think that's what people want. I mean, the theory is one thing, but actually putting it into action uh, is another thing, and most people uh, really want to know how to do things and get at least get some ideas on how to do things. And so my whole life has been that way. I was a practical executive leader. I mean, I understood the theory, but I also understood that theory is not implementable unless you have people that are that are turned on with with passion and and drive to actually do it. And so, you know, that's what kind of separated me from from the crowd. And uh, I try and, and instill that in, in, in people. Um, you know, it's not about what you know. It's about what you do with what you know. And it's as simple as that. That is, uh, I mean, that definitely is uh, sound advice, right? It's not about what you know, but what you do with what you know. And uh, I think this will be a good, good pivot to what we're going to talk about. And I'll come back to this. Uh, how it relates to career professionals. But one thing I'm sure anybody is listening to this, even myself, um, in the beginning I wanted to ask this, I love the name be different or be dead.com. I mean, it, it is very catchy. It is to the point because right away you have an idea of what the content is going to be about. So what is, I, I wanted to ask you, Roy, I, what, what is the 
origin of that? How did you come up with that? Uh, kudos to coming up with that uh, uh, title or caption. It's great. So if you, can you tell us a little bit more what exactly is Be Different or Be Dead? Yeah, thanks, and thank you for the, the compliment. I, I It kind of resonates with a lot of people. It turns out that um, I was, my major career, um, I kind of passed on from that about uh, a little over 10 years ago and decided at a very young age, decided that uh, I needed to to, uh, to keep working. And one of the things that my wife suggested that I do is is get out and do the things that I I love to do, which is speaking with people, passing on new ideas, exciting them to do different things. And so I went on the road doing a bunch of seminars based on what I learned in my career. And that's the other thing. The stuff that I talk about when I say it's practical, it's practical because I did it. And so my whole content, my whole content marketing thing is about what successfully worked for me in 33 going on to 40 years now as a leader uh, in the in the business environment. So I went on, the, <clears throat> created a whole bunch of seminars and did a bunch of work for uh, the chambers of commerce, businesses, you know, the, the, the usual thing across Canada. And the one seminar that really resonated with people, I entitled Be Different or Be Dead. And the whole premise behind Be Different or Be Dead is that if you can't find a way to stand out in a chaotic marketplace, be noticed and be remarkable, then eventually you will be irrelevant and you will die. And there's plenty of uh, evidence of that, ranging from uh, Nortel to other organizations that, that basically are no longer with us. My contention is, and the facts prove it out, that they weren't different. They were the same as everybody else. Nobody had a good reason to buy from them, and then therefore they stopped buying and they died. So the, the genesis of Be Different or Be Dead was actually from a seminar that eventually people said, why don't you put all this stuff into a book? And so I wrote Be Different or Be Dead, Your Business Survival Guide in 2009 as a response to, if you will, my customers wanting documentation around my compendium of learnings. And so, yeah, it's resonated with people. Um, interesting sideline. I had a heck of a time with my publisher who really didn't like the whole notion of expressing something that way. <laughs> and I said, well, so sad. <laughs> we're going to we're going to publish it. And so that that title and that book has actually led me now to five ebooks, which I published around the be different or be dead theme, which basically takes a slice of the work and, and, and expands it in more detail. And so there's, for example, marketing in the storm, which takes the marketing piece of be different or be dead and expands it for people. Uh, what is relevant, probably more relevant uh, to your audience is uh, the ebook that I wrote called be different you, which takes the be different or be dead principles and applies them to careers. And so young professionals, I would think would be very interested in, in that as a resource to them. And so, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's pe people are always, they go, wow, it's a pretty interesting name. I wonder what that's all about. And of course, that's obviously the kind of response that, uh, that excites me personally. Yeah. Thanks Roy for that, uh, um, for the, the brief rundown. And I think, uh, sometimes the best things just happen, right? It just grows organically. You get an idea, you try it, the audience gives you the feedback and you build on that. So the book titles that you have referred to, I'll definitely add that as a summary uh, when I'm posting this interview. Um, now, one thing I did mention, I wrote this quote down because I, do, I, I love quotes and I like to share them on all my social media profiles. Sometimes I'm not feeling the greatest. I read quotes. And as you were mentioning at the beginning of this interview, something I, I wrote down is it's not about what you know but what you do with what you know. Um, now, that I think is a great segue for young professionals, uh, let's say new grads or someone who's very, very new to the job market. Uh, there is, you hear this and you read this all the time that young professionals or millennials or whatever the different names they are called, Gen Yers, uh, they come into the market with with an education, with a degree, and they consider themselves underemployed. Uh, so I think that 
the whole notion of a degree is not enough is what I'm trying to get at. But uh, c- can you expand on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I just um, am in the process or just I just my latest Globe and Mail article on this on leadership uh, had a quote in there which said, you know, don't I mean, successful people are not mes- mesmerized by their own academic pedigree, which really goes to say that most people out there looking for jobs, particularly young professionals, are well educated. And so if if the challenge is is if everybody espouses the same level of academic proficiency, then how does one stand out, get noticed, and and actually get the prize? And so my view in this is always, and unfortunately, uh, Nassar, um, our education system does a woefully inadequate job of preparing our young people when they leave the school to actually go into this this world of what I call uh, herdish and crowdish behavior, uh, separate them from that and, and actually uh, be successful. And so my advice to them is always um, accept and be grateful for your academic training, but it won't get you the prize. Okay, because there's too many people that will claim the same thing. Okay, what it will do is it will get you in the game, uh, but it won't necessarily guarantee that you're going to win the game. And so then the question is, well, how do I win the game? The first thing to realize is there are no silver bullets in this career game. There is no formula to to determine exactly what um, input variables, if you will, will work highly efficiently together to yield a dependent variable that says success in your career it doesn't exist, even though you know we come from the, the the education system, which is based on precision and 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 perfection, quote unquote, which, which in business doesn't doesn't exist anyway. And so, my advice is always to try and get your head around that you need to figure out um, over time how what is uh, special about you that nobody else can claim and then start to leverage that behavior on top of a platform of proficient, you know, academia. And so I talk an awful lot about in, in Be Different You about the personal only statement, which basically says, I am the only one that. So if you're looking for a brand and everybody's talking about brands these days, I mean, brand is not something that says, you know, I understand marketing. I'm a marketing person. That's not a brand. That's just another way of encapsulating, you know, what you think you're good at academically. Okay. Um, uh, I think a brand that that would resonate with people is I'm the only marketing person that, and it's of course that's the challenge is to is to complete the sentence. And so the only way to do that is to actually accept the fact it's a journey. Understand that you need to create this, carve out this only uniqueness and start working on it. Try it. Do it. Try it. Revise it, etc., etc. as you go. As I say, there's a lot more content about this in Be Different You, and, and that would be something that you, that you may want to look at. But the really important takeaway is get over yourself. Get over yourself when it comes to the fact that you've got a doctorate in economics. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Because I know a lot of doctors who are um, not exactly doing what they want to do in their life. And one of the big things that annoys me is they feel entitled to it because of their academic uh, achievements. And don't get me wrong, I think it's wonderful to have the achievement, but unfortunately it's not enough. And so my, my passion is to try and get young professionals to get over themselves when it comes to their degree and learn new practical things that work because I've done them and I can help them. That's, that's very interesting. The whole concept of I'm the only one that, and I, I, I think that is a little, I don't think most people, including myself have necessarily uh, heard about it or read about it. And you're totally correct. The whole concept of branding, there seems to be a personal branding movement. 
and it's all about making you stand out. But I do, uh, I do concur with you that it's not only in, it's not enough just to stand out. How do you take it to the next level? So that's that's a great insight, insight, Roy. Uh, something that makes me, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, wow, that is something I need to start doing right away. What can I do? So I th- uh, the question I have, and I'm sure someone listening to this, okay. Um, let's say I just graduated or let's say I'm really, really new. Let's take the marketing example you just gave us. So what are some of the things I can do to say that I'm the only one that, so it's a follow up question to your last point is how can I make myself unique? What are some of the things, some of the ideas that I can come up with? How do I stitch everything together? Well, the first thing that you really need to get clear is you need to un- clearly understand how the herd behaves. Okay. Like, like I call them the young professional herd and I I've seen them. I've had them in the interviews and they're all the same. They all have the same resumes that say the same boilerplated things. Right. And the other thing is they generally don't really understand my business. So the first thing you have to do is whatever business um, you're interested in, and by the way, I want to come back to that because there's not enough time spent what I would call defining your target when you're a young professional in terms of of, of who, who you would like to, to spend the rest of your life with. And I want to come to that, back to that concept too, which is foreign to most people. But really, you need to, you need to understand and take the time to understand the issues, okay, that are being faced by the organization that you're interested in. I mean, if you don't, if you don't take the time to do it, why should they even bother listening to you? Because, you know, I mean, it's, you're, you're not there to flog yourself. What you're there to do is, is understand the realities that they have and then communicate how you would play into them. And one effective way to do it is, let's say, Let's say that um, that the organization in question, by virtue of the research that the young professional has done, they conclude has got some marketing challenges. It could be that, you know, they've got uh, market share issues and they've got product branding issues, whatever. A young professional walking in, if I were the, the hiring uh, manager of that organization and somebody walked through the door and acknowledged what my problems were, first of all, I would be impressed. The reason for that is nobody else is doing it. So there's one aspect of quote only, if you want. But secondly, if they then went on to talk about, even though they didn't have practical experience working in the world, here's how they could apply their academic knowledge to help solve my problem. And so the two-pronged approach acknowledging and understanding what issues I'm facing, and secondly, describing, maybe a little bit in sort of like theoretical terms, uh, how they could apply their knowledge to solve the problem would make them stand out to me. For no other reason is that nobody else does it. And it would show initiative, it would show caring. If they cared enough about my company to actually go do some research on it, um, then I would find that they would be worth listening to. Okay, so, and there may be other facets to this. Again, I don't want to formularize it because there's no formula for creating your only, but there is kind of like a direction. You know, do some research, figure out what the problems are, figure out how to leverage what you know in terms of helping that person solve their problems. That would be a major step forward. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And if I can summarize what he just said is do some research on the, the company you're interviewing for or the career that you want to get into. And secondly, also do some research on yourself. Learn a little bit more about what, uh, what makes you unique, what makes you different and try to see if you can fit them together. Did I, did I summarize that very well or did I miss anything there? The only thing I don't want anybody to get the, the impression is this, this only definition is easy. It's not. In fact, you know, it, take, it can take years to nail this, okay, um, because it involves trial and error. 
right? And it involves getting real, not um, kind of like aspirational. Like there's a lot of, you know, I really, I'm good at conflict management. What does that mean? I mean, I mean, everybody can say that. And so what you need to do is get granular and really specific in terms of the claim. And, and, and what I would suggest is keep drilling it down and down and down and down. It's almost like an inverted triangle. You start off with a general view of what you think makes you unique, and you drill it down to specifics. And then what you do, Nassar, is you go test it. You go ask people, here's what I think I'm unique in. What do you think? And they'll tell you, right? And the basis of, of that testing, you know, you either revise it or you may say, wow, I actually got this fairly correct. And, and my advice is always, I mean, if you're 70% correct, go do it. Learn from it and fix it and revise it as you go. There's no such thing as silver bullets in this stuff. None whatsoever. But let me give you an example of, of what I did. Um, I worked in a, in, a, in a monopoly telco. And very early on in my career, I realized that the monopoly business was destined to end, that eventually there would be competition. I then reasoned that in a competitive world, um, customer service and marketing were the two functions that, that the telco really needed to do better. So I went out and I created myself as an expert in customer service and marketing. My degree isn't marketing, it's mathematics. I learned marketing from a practical point of view. I said, what are the principles of marketing that we can apply that will make a difference in a competitive world? What are the principles of customer service, et cetera? So I essentially grew my only brand in a monopoly company into a guy that understood the importance of customer service and marketing in a highly and intensely competitive world. That was my only. I was the only guy that could claim that because truthfully, I was the only one thinking about it. Made my job difficult. But so, so you can see what I mean, right? I mean, that's the process. And if there were another issue that, that, that came along at some point, um, then what you do is you kind of flex and say, well, all right, do I want to play there and try and create a unique persona or not? So you, it's organic. You see where I'm going. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's great to hear. I mean, you started out uh, with a degree in mathematics and you pivoted to over time build yourself as an expert in marketing, which is totally different tangents, right? Like mathematics and marketing don't go hand in hand, I believe. I mean, there, there is some data element to it, but in general, like it's two different career fields. So, uh, so you, you, might... you know what makes, you know what the common element is? And we could spend a lot of time talking about that. The common element is the ability to solve problems. That's what my math degree taught me. I've never applied a differential equation to solve a business mm -hmm. problem. But what I have done is applied the kind of methodical, logistical approach to analyzing and solving problems to business. Marketing is no different. The problem-solving capability must be present, otherwise you can't move forward. So, in fact, I'm, I'm in, in the middle of writing a blog article. So what, what did I what, did, what part of my, my education did I really use in being a leader? And the common element is solving problems. It ain't about the content. It's about the process. Interesting. huh? No, th that is definitely interesting because there's always something. Uh, it is not you're right. It's not necessarily the equations you learn in mathematics, but there's always some underlying principles or skill set that you can transfer to any job or any career you go. And that's, that's, that is very, very reinforcing because um, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people, young professionals, they, they have the assumption, they have the misunderstanding that, oh, this is my degree and I need to get a job in this degree. And, and they, they get, they get frustrated in the process. So, that is a good tangent itself. Uh, just one thing I wanted to point out, Roy, is because you mentioned your your uh, journey with your career. Uh, the last episode I had a young fellow, um, he had a psychology degree, and now he works as a marketing manager for a technology startup. And it's like psychology and marketing, it's not in terms of an, a career field, there's no direct path. However, he did exactly what he did. He spent his time, free time, learning marketing, 
and over time he uh, he found the company they, he showed that he can solve his problems solve their problems and now he's working there so uh, just because you have a degree don't get stuck in that particular route or path is is what i'm hearing from this yeah and the other way to look at this is when you're in a business what you have to do is you have to apply what the business needs not necessarily what you know and if there's a gap go learn it okay so you know it gets down to one of the fundamental differences in, and i mean this in the most in the most gracious way one of the the, the the biggest differences between the the environment that young professionals are in today and and what i went through is that there is an expectation today that you will apply what you've learned not necessarily apply what the business needs and if you don't know it you go get it all right this whole issue of expectations i have a doctorate in economics i expect to go into business find a job and apply economics well there's two issues one if you find yourself in a position where you can't apply economics then maybe you chose the wrong company right maybe what you should have done as we discussed earlier is picked a company whose whose problem could be solved with the application of economic principles so if you miss that shame on you yeah you know, don't don't blame the company you're now in get out and go find one who's got economic principles or the other thing you do is if you love the company you're in then what you do is figure out how to go learn what they need and say okay i'm going to salvage whatever i can from my economic learnings and by the way you, you can <laughs> there's always a healthy part of what you what you've learned that can be salvaged and even though somebody may say well we really have got a uh, uh, this other kind of we've got a sales we got a customer loyalty issue not an economic issue well there are some similarities if you just look and so that to me is a pretty pretty significant um uh issue that young professionals need to get really comfortable with and unfortunately our education system has not done young professionals any favors because they do raise the expectations that you know you got a first class honors mark in economics go forth and and do economics well guess what the probability of that happening is really low get used to it and deal with it the other thing i would say is that i honestly don't think that a young professional's objective should be to get um when they go when they go into the workforce should be career oriented i think it should be job oriented because i in my experience a career is a function of how many jobs you've done not over what you started out and you entered the business world in let me give you an example my career i would define as a, as a leadership career didn't start out that way i mean i started out working in the systems department um writing computer programs because math and computer science in those days were my major okay that so that was a job i didn't enter the 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 organization to become a leader how the hell would you ever know that right at 21 years old you don't so you go get a job you know go get a job earn some money learn some stuff and then move from there and so my meandering through the organization um basically allowed me to touch every aspect of business that's why i'm a practical guy that's why i know all the stuff every aspect of business and what i loved was the ability to excite people and motivate them to do different things aka leadership didn't start out that way go get a job learn some shit move on that's how to get a career you don't enter business with an objective of starting out in a path that essentially describes a career never happens well th th that's that's very interesting and that's another uh a contrarian approach something that you don't hear a lot right i mean uh <laughs> you never hear it yeah and that that's amazing because i'm 
one of the things I get a little bit confused, as I say, I'm, I, re, I do read a lot of blogs and articles and the whole the whole movement of follow your passion. And, uh, you know, and always everybody quotes Steve Jobs when, of course, Steve Jobs gave a speech when he was 50 years old about follow your passion. But and many people that I speak to or have, have, have come across get fall into this. This discussion about follow your passion versus finding a job and building some skills and building a career, like you mentioned, based on the job. So, can you talk on that? Talk about that. The whole idea of it's everywhere. It's, you cannot go a day where you do not read about the whole passion movement, uh, if I may say. Well, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Steve Jobs. I'd be an idiot not to. Um, but from my own personal view, um, if 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 people look at it, it gets it gets down to is success knowledge based or is it feelings based? And I've always believed that it's it's all about feelings, how you feel about something, um, how excited you get about something. And so passion and feelings are the fuel that basically drive people's behavior. And it's that behavior that yields success or failure. And sometimes failure, 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 then success. Uh, that's a rare commodity out there. It really is. And so um, finding something that excites you is absolutely critical. But I would take it a step further. And I would say find the excitement in what you do. You may not have it to begin with, but go find it. Look at everything has got um, uh, the potential of exciting the right side of the brain. Everything. The real secret is, uh, do you have the jam? Do you have the tenacity? Do you have the perseverance to go find it? If I think back on, on my sort of formal career, that was one of the things that that always drove me is like there were there were times when uh, I was given something to do and I, I said oh god this sucks right I don't want to do this um, but when I really looked at it and dissected it there were elements of that task that I found intriguing and exciting and I built and leveraged on those and what people saw around me of me doing this were really those elements um, of excitement and passion. No, that that makes total sense. Like uh, find the excitement in what you do, and everything has the potential to excite the right brain. And uh, in terms of like a very simple, simple analogy, I, I think you might chuckle at this. Is the uh, I'm I'm in Toronto. You you are in British Columbia. Canada has a uh, is always known to be a cold place to be. In the we have long winters. Personally, myself, I'm not a fan. But there are people I know who get excited by the winter because they like to go out and ski, right? So they found something that many people do not enjoy, and they made made it an advantage uh, or something that they enjoy. So you can draw similar parallels with your career or with your job for instance uh, there might be things that you don't like but uh, there are things that you definitely like and any change that it changes your mindset well you know let's face it um, you will always be confronted with something a, a task or a program or a project that that you look at and it, and it's drudgery on first glance you don't like it well you have a couple of choices you can either make Make that feeling explicit, which I wouldn't recommend to the person assigning it to you, or you can graciously accept it. And what I would say is go find the pony. So you know the difference between an optimist and a pessimist, Nisar. The pessimist is somebody who's walking along the road and uh, comes across a great big mound of horse dung and says, oh, my God, this is horrible. I can't get by the road with all of this unsightly material in front of me. The optimist, when confronted by the same pile of horse dung, 
dives in the middle of it looking for the pony that created it. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I want as many people looking for a pony as possible. Just another way of saying, go find something interesting. You know, don't let don't let the the the, the first blush of what what you're confronted with um, turn you off. And for heaven's sakes, don't make those turned off feelings known to the to the person who's actually giving you something to do. That's that's a kiss of death, isn't it? Yeah, it, it definitely. There's always a there is a, like they say, right? There's always a silver lining in the cloud. Uh, the, or, or the, a glass is never uh, a glass is always full type of mentality. Uh, so, Roy, so far we covered a lot about the mindset, right? We talked about uh, in, uh, the passion. We talked about the whole concept of uh, thinking about how do we become the only one versus uh, the best or personal branding. So far, it's great. So, one of the things I want to now uh, dive into is so. We got the mind. We talk about the attitude. We talk about the mindset, the drive, and everything. So let's say someone gets started. So now uh, they figured out this is the job. I'm enjoying it. You know, over time, I'll build a career. What are some of the things they can do? And perhaps you can share your experience. You've already did in terms of how to build on that. So how 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 should a ideal journey look like? Well, you know. It's it's not very elegantly described, quite frankly, because um, I think in most cases, uh, careers are built on the backs of um, experience. And uh, we talked about earlier and a, a desire uh, to uh, to constantly be learning and doing other things like you never know what the end point looks like. You just never know. I mean, there's too many um, random variables that get in your way. Life is not predictable. And I got to tell you, you know, careers aren't predictable um, in organizations. There's too many things happening. So for me, um, looking, if, if I were to give advice um, to somebody, I would say you need to get in. And we talked about that. You need to get into an organization whose culture you like, whose future is bright, and where you want to spend some time. Get in. And then when you're in, uh, do your work. Learn about it. Um, start to work on your uh, your personal unique in, in terms of what you love and, and what you do. And just see where that will take you. It's okay not to know the next step until it's right in front of your face. I mean, it's like somebody saying, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, I don't know. It's pretty cool being a fireman. It's pretty cool being a, a, a computer, blah, blah, blah. But really, until you actually experience some life and experience some, um, some, some uh, uh, mistakes and successes and failures, you don't really know. So that journey thing, okay, is really, really important. I think it's something that young professionals have a difficult time with, to be honest. In a world that, that preaches instant gratification, this is a tough concept for them to accept, for anybody to accept. All right, expect to come in, get a, get a job, get set, get gratification, reach my goals, and then move on. Well... Yeah, that may happen every once in a while, but in any business that I know, that never happens. And in fact, the people that exhibit that behavior don't really succeed all that well as compared to people who are um, who get in, who who are focused on achieving, who are loyal to the people around them and the organization and who are prepared to, to sacrifice themselves um, and wait for opportunities. And if they don't come, fine, but at least give it a shot. Don't expect a formula. Don't expect anything. I mean, what you will end up getting is a function of what you put in, not a function of what the organization offers. You need to create shit for yourself. 
that's what you do. Thanks, Roy, for that. That that makes sense. Again, it uh, goes back to doing versus too much of planning. And uh, so, one the final thing I want to speak about is um, the the whole concept of mentorship. I think in your articles that you submit uh, for career matters, you sprinkle some of this in there. Uh, the idea of mentorship. So, uh, first of all. Those who do not know what it is, if you can explain what is mentorship, why is it important or is it important at all? And uh, how can one go about finding one? Yeah, ment- for, to young professionals, mentorship and a mentor is is probably the most critical thing that, that, that you can have. Uh, a mentor is simply someone or something. It can be a thing. Generally, it's a it's a someone who um, can give you guidance, can give you guidance in your career and advice on challenges that that confront you. And so finding a mentor, a sounding board, somebody you're safe with is extremely important. Um, mentors can be uh, typically there are people that you actually engage with, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, my my most memorable mentors when I was a young professional really were people that I never met, but whose work influenced me and guided me. One was Seth Godin, who's still writing in, uh, in, in incredible fashion. Purple Cow is another way of talking about uh, uniqueness, and he's got some brilliant insights, and I learned from Seth. Every day I, I have his blog uh, emailed to me every day. Another guy, um, it was Tom Peters who talked about In Search of Excellence and what creates excellence in companies. I've met neither of these people, and yet their content speaks to me, always has spoken to me, and I learned from that, and it helped shape my behavior as a leader in an organization and a professional in, in whatever discipline I was working in. That's kind of one angle of it, right? The other angle, of course, is to find somebody that you can press the flesh with. And that's typically the most common form of mentorship. And it's a very, very important one. It's a a resource available where you can pick up the phone and and have a chat with, et cetera, et cetera. My advice here is, and it's a separate issue from how you get a mentor, but the kind of mentor that young professionals, I think, would value more than than others would be somebody who's actually demonstrated something. You know, again, I go back to my my uh, my precept that says it's about uh, demonstrated achievements as opposed to intellectual capabilities. What you what you've done as opposed to what you know. So find somebody who's been really really good at actually taking concepts and theories and principles. Right. And and breathing life into them through crude deeds is what I call crude deed being simply getting it done, executing it in the real world. The challenge for young professionals is to figure out how to actually get one. And again, there's no um, formulas for this. It's extremely hard work. But here's a process that that I'll just talk to you about. First of all, identify who you want. I mean, don't go to a a networking event having idea whether the person who can help you and would even lean towards you is there. So start out with who in the business world would you love to have as a mentor? Now, this intimidates a lot of young professionals. Because they think, oh, why would that person ever talk to me? Blah, 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 blah. Don't even go there yet. Figure it out. Who do you want? If, if your career uh, is, is uh, destined in, to be marketing, then don't you think you should find somebody who you, who you admire in terms of what they have achieved from a marketing point of view? So you need to define those people and have a handful of them. I'm not talking 20 or 25, maybe three. Because you can't do 25 things anyways. 
The second thing is get to know them without even meeting them. Do your research. Where do they hang out? Who do they hang out with? What events do they go to? Then now start to figure out a way. And by the way, what are their business challenges? Again, getting back to this whole notion of really understanding what I would call your target in this particular case. Figure out where they hang out. Go to those hangouts. Okay? Be brave and initiate a conversation. But at least if you know the issues that they're facing in their organization or whatever, you're in a better position to be heard. And then begin the relationship. Begin the relationship. It's not about asking for advice. It's about creating a relationship where there's comfort here. And the other person suddenly feels, and it will happen over time if you do it right, will feel obliged, actually, to help you. You know, it's it's amazing to me how many people um, have said to me, well, I didn't even realize you'd be interested in commenting on what I've done. Well, why would you ever have that presumption? If you have that presumption, then you're really forsaking a number of opportunities that may be right in front of you. You have to be brave. You have to be brave. There are a lot of people like me who want to help young professionals. A lot of them. So you need to find them, which is something that you're trying to do. Nisar here through your your blog and your your series, and, and I commend you for it. You have to get people who are wanting to help connected with people who need to help. Um, you're creating a, a, a stable of potential mentors for people, and that's a good thing. Thanks, Rod. Thanks for uh, a, a quick. Uh I mean, thanks for your feedback on the blog. I appreciate it. It's always good, it's always good to know what you're doing well, what you can improve. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so, right. Uh, th- thank you very much. Uh, uh, I've personally learned a lot. The whole purpose was that the listeners would learn a lot. But as you were saying, uh, all the things you're saying, I was feverishly taking notes. Uh, I got a few quotes that I would like to share uh, along with the along with the post when it is published. But uh, this was, uh, I learned a lot. As a takeaway for myself, I can tell you always, you have put the seed of the whole concept of the only one in my in my brain. So that is, uh, that's a seed I think I need to build on and focus on and work on, uh, both for my blog and even for myself. So thanks for that. Uh, there is definitely lots of valuable advice that I got here. Um, final question before uh, we let you go. Where can people find you? And how can they reach you? Okay. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity to um, to have a conversation about what I consider probably one of the most important subjects today, which is how to enable young professionals to uh, do what they really want to do and, and, and build our, our country and our economy. Uh, you can find me at uh, be different or be dead.com. That's my website. I have that's where my blog is. That's where you can get access to my books. Um, and as well, as I said, I'm, I'm writing for you. I do a lot of writing for other channels as well on different subjects. So if you Google me, uh, you will get uh, exposed to or at least understand um, the, the, other, the other media that, that I'm playing with at the moment. Um, the other thing is, um, my email address is roy.osing at telos.net. Uh, I'm totally okay with having a striking up a conversation with somebody who, who listens to this and has some questions about some aspect of it. You guys out there, for heaven's sakes, be brave. Send an email. It's okay. I don't mind that at all. I'm here to help. Yeah, and, and Roy, uh, just to just for everyone's understanding uh, I, that's how I reached out to you by I, I sent you a simple email about my blog and if you'd like to contribute so and you responded right away so you're right it's uh, it, it could be intimidating but a simple email uh, it could is all it takes to build a great relationship so thanks for giving your email I'll, I'll, uh, yeah that strategy definitely works emailing someone definitely works well, Roy, thank you very much once again. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on par- part of the podcast. And 
uh, for everyone listening. Uh, thanks for listening to the episode. I'm, I'm sure, like myself, you have learned a lot as well. Feel free to uh, write a review or write your comments and uh, and also read the summary at the end of the episode as well. Thanks, everyone. The, until next time, this is uh, Nisar Ahmed from the Korean Medis Podcast. Bye.